the Drug Enforcement Administration opened an investigation into a narcotics trafficking operation that brought illicit substances across the border from Mexico into the US and eventually into New York City. Among those who participated in the conspiracy was 32-year-old Yesenia Jimenez, an NYPD officer living in the Bronx. According to the DEA's findings, Jimenez used her apartment to house large quantities of heroin, fentanyl, and cocaine that had been smuggled from Mexico. Along with her criminal associates, the woman helped distribute the drugs in New York and Boston, collecting hundreds of thousands of dollars in the process. Jimenez was accused of taking part in a conspiracy from at least June of 2017 until March of 2018 when she was arrested. Members of both the DEA and NYPD apprehended the suspect and an accomplice as they returned to her apartment with $52,000 in cash. It later emerged that the money they were carrying stemmed from recent narcotics transactions in the Boston area. Despite being off duty at the time, Jimenez was carrying her department-issued firearm in her purse. The woman lied to the arresting officers, telling them she was on official police business. Her claims of innocence ultimately fell on deaf ears and she was hit with a number of serious criminal charges. In March of 2019, following a week-long trial, she was found guilty of conspiring to distribute heroin, fentanyl and cocaine, possession of heroin and fentanyl, and using a firearm in furtherance of drug trafficking. The district court sentenced Jimenez to 192 months of imprisonment, followed by a five-year term of supervised release. Number 22. Russell Maranto Law enforcement in Loveland, Colorado, received reports of a woman wandering in and out of traffic while speaking incoherently on the night of May the 20th of 2023. Officers found the woman roaming the area near North Garfield Avenue and East 29th Street. She was placed in protective custody and brought to the hospital for evaluation. Loveland police later revealed that upon arrival at the hospital, the woman was handcuffed in an examination room. She was accused of being verbally abusive towards medical staff and reportedly spat on both a nurse and a police officer. In response, the latter punched the woman in the face, inflicting minor injuries. Another officer subsequently intervened and removed his colleague from the room. In the wake of the incident, the officer who struck the female suspect was identified as 28-year-old Russell Maranto. He was placed on administrative leave while his actions on the night in question were investigated. The following month, Loveland Police Chief Tim Doran released a video explaining his decision to fire Maranto for what he labeled an excessive use of force in the spirit of transparency. Doran's video included body cam footage from the exam room, which showed the woman, identified as 59-year-old Angelia Hall, spitting on Maranto right before he socked her in the face. Hall was charged with third-degree assault for her actions towards the officer. Number 21. Donovan William Rojas Several Monroe County deputies in Key Largo, Florida, chased a speeding Chrysler 300 down US Route 1 shortly before 4 a.m. on June the 12th of 2022. The vehicle was traveling at speeds of more than 110 miles per hour as it swerved in and out of different lanes. Pursuing deputies tailed the Chrysler for three miles before the suspect finally stopped at mile marker 105. The man behind the wheel identified himself as a member of the Miami-Dade Police Department, revealing that the Chrysler was his unmarked agency vehicle. Deputies reportedly observed emergency lights activated on the car's visor, which they hadn't been able to see during the pursuit. The motorist, who was later identified as 26-year-old Donovan William Rojas, was exhibiting signs of impairment and apparently smelled like alcohol. He refused sobriety tests, so deputies brought him to the county jail where he was booked on charges of driving while intoxicated as well as fleeing and eluding inside the Chrysler. Investigators found two handguns, a Miami-Dade police ID and badge, and a department-issued body camera. Rojas was suspended from the force without pay following his arrest. Number 20. Pablo Estrada During the early morning hours of November the 28th of 2020, Officer Pablo Estrada from the Lafayette Parish Sheriff's Office in Louisiana arrested a 23-year-old man accused of beating his pregnant girlfriend. The handcuffed suspect was transported to Lafayette Parish Correctional Center and held in a room 
while Officer Estrada filled out paperwork. Video footage of the two men inside the police station showed Estrada instructing the unnamed suspect to take a seat. Although issues with the camera system caused the audio to cut out at certain moments, the young man could be heard telling the officer that he wasn't trying to be difficult. He remained standing while Estrada sat behind the computer and once again ordered him to sit down. The suspect then took a step towards the officer who quickly stood up saying, have a seat, I'm not playing with you. In the moments that followed, Estrada placed two hands on the suspect and pushed him against the wall before delivering a closed hand strike to his abdomen. The man protested Estrada's use of force, stating, y'all put your hands on me for nothing, I'm not even doing nothing. The suspect would go on to be indicted on battery charges, stemming from the incident with his girlfriend as well as resisting an officer for his non-compliance with Estrada. He pleaded not guilty to both offenses. Estrada, meanwhile, wasn't charged in connection with his rough treatment of the young man. He was, however, notified of his termination from the force on February the 22nd of 2021. Estrada challenged the police chief's decision by filing an appeal with the Lafayette Fire and Police Civil Service Board. In January of 2023, it was announced that Estrada had been reinstated to the department. The board reportedly determined that he hadn't violated department policy in any way. Number 19. Robert Rosen on February the 11th of 2021, the Aurora Police Department in Colorado released a statement detailing the termination of Officer Robert Rosen for using excessive force during an arrest. The incident in question occurred in August of 2020 when Rosen was called to assist a fellow officer at the King Supers grocery store on South Parker Road. Upon arrival, the officer found his colleague on the ground with a suspect who was passively resisting by laying on his stomach and keeping his arms pinned underneath his body. Without first attempting lesser means of force or issuing any verbal orders, Rosen sprung into action by briefly trying to pull the suspect's arms out from under him. When that failed, the officer began punching the man, hitting him multiple times in the ribs. He also deployed his taser five times for a total of 27 seconds. The suspect sustained minor injuries and was taken to a local hospital before being booked for allegedly trespassing on King Super's property. Rosen's actions during the arrest were reviewed by the department's force review board, which in turn recommended that the matter be investigated by the Internal Affairs Bureau. The resulting investigation uncovered that Rosen had failed to activate his body camera when he arrived at the scene that night. He also neglected to document his justifications for the force he used during the arrest. In all, Rosen was found to have violated five department directives and was consequently fired. Number 18. James Sanders Officer James Sanders with the Social Circle Police Department in Georgia was involved in an incident on November the 23rd of 2016 that ultimately led to his termination a few weeks later. On the day in question, Sanders was on duty when he heard someone in a passing jeep yell out, F the police! Outraged! Sanders proceeded to chase the vehicle down and initiate a traffic stop, which he neglected to radio into dispatch. The officer then interrogated the Jeep's teenage occupants, ultimately determining that it was the passenger who hurled the profane insult. Sanders ordered the teen out of the car and tormented him, trying to coax the boy into a physical fight. Eventually, another officer arrived at the scene and, as shown in body cam footage, admitted that the teens hadn't done anything to warrant being pulled over. Nevertheless, the two cops searched the Jeep as well as the teens but let them go when it became clear they had nothing incriminating in their possession. An anonymous complaint to the Social Circle Police Department led to an internal review of the incident, culminating in Sanders getting fired in early December. Records indicated that Sanders had gotten into trouble before for harassing members of the public, including an instance where he allegedly threatened to taser a school administrator and blow up a building. Number 17. Gemma Dix and Adam Reed. Allegations of gross misconduct were leveled against a Welsh police constable during the summer of 2020. 28-year-old Gemma Dix 
was accused of having intimate relations with her superior on multiple occasions, including at various locations within Cardiff Central Police Station. The junior officer's repeated encounters with Sergeant Adam Reed, a married father of two, spanned 10 months. During at least one of their liaisons at the police station, which occurred between November of 2017 and August of 2018, Dix had allegedly been on duty. A misconduct panel ultimately ruled that her actions constituted a serious breach of professional behavior and amounted to gross misconduct that damaged the police service's reputation and community standing. After details of the affair came to light, 40-year-old Reed resigned from the force. In August of 2020, it was announced that Dix had been spared termination and was instead issued a written warning. Panel chairwoman Emma Boothroyd stated that she didn't accept Dix's claims that Reed had manipulated her into continuing their relationship. Boothroyd did, however, commend Dix for volunteering information about her encounters with Reed as well as showing genuine remorse for her behavior. Number 16. Lords hadn't felt. In February of 2019, a police officer from Des Moines, Iowa, claimed to have been hit and injured by a car that was fleeing a traffic stop. 33-year-old Lords hadn't felt had worked on the force since June of 2017, having previously served as an officer for the Perry Police Department. About 40 miles northwest of Des Moines, hadn't felt filed a report detailing her alleged encounter with a female motorist who'd driven into the middle of a snow removal operation, only to speed away from the scene when confronted. The driver was later stopped along I-235 and faced charges of operating while intoxicated, as well as interference with official acts. An internal department investigation led to the discovery that hadn't felt hadn't been completely truthful in her report. In reality, she'd never been struck by the vehicle as she claimed. The internal review also found that Haddon Felt lied under oath during a deposition preparing for the criminal charges against the driver, identified as Olesya Holker. As a result of the officer's untruthfulness, Holker had the charge of interference with official acts dropped. The woman claimed to have driven away from the traffic stop because Haddon Felt was being abusive. The officer acknowledged the inaccuracies in her official report, which she claimed to have written entirely from memory without referencing her body cam footage. In July of 2019, Haddon Felt was fired from her job. Number 15. Kashif Mahmoud A massive corruption scandal hit Greater London's Metropolitan Police Service in the spring of 2021. For the findings of an official investigation, Officer Kashif Mahmoud collaborated with an organized crime ring based in Dubai to steal money from drug dealers. Five other suspects were charged in connection with the case and ended up receiving prison sentences of up to 16 years as punishment. In court, the sophisticated crime group's leader in Dubai was identified as Mujaba Niazmund. Using encrypted messaging platforms to communicate, Niazmund would inform the gang's UK leader, Moshin Khan, about drug couriers carrying large amounts of money. In turn, Khan would pass the details on to Mahmoud, a police officer of 10 years. Mahmoud used police cars from Stoke Newington Police Station and had an accomplice pose as his partner. They would then stop and search the targets, many of whom had been given the cash by the Khan gang as part of a drug deal. After seizing the money under the guise of police procedure, Mahmoud would hand it over to his criminal associates who ended up with both the drugs and money from the transaction. In total, the group stole over a million dollars from drug dealers according to prosecutors. In early 2020, French police and cybersecurity experts penetrated EncroChat, the encrypted network used by the Khan gang. The collapse of EncroChat contributed to the crime group's demise, as did a series of blunders on the part of Mahmoud and his associates. During one of the gang's jobs, they unwittingly targeted a drug courier who was being monitored by law enforcement. Surveillance officers stopped Mahmoud and his partner after witnessing them seize cash from the courier. They forced him to create an intelligence report back at the police station, which would ultimately be used as evidence against him in court. Additionally, Mahmoud's body camera inadvertently turned on during the unauthorized stop, capturing his accomplice dressed in a police uniform. 
In May of 2021, Mahmoud was sentenced to eight years behind bars. Number 14, Matthew Rodriguez. The police in Warren, Michigan, arrested a carjacking suspect and brought him to the city jail for booking on June the 12th of 2023. While the suspect, identified as Jaquan Smith, was being processed, Officer Matthew Rodriguez launched a vicious physical attack on him. As captured by the jail's security cameras, 48-year-old Rodriguez suddenly lunged towards Smith and knocked him to the ground. He proceeded to bash the suspect's head against the floor before striking him again. Although the footage didn't include audio, Warren Police Commissioner Bill Dwyer indicated that there might have been words exchanged between Rodriguez and Smith prior to the attack. Nevertheless, Dwyer labeled the officer's actions as completely unjustified and unprofessional, stating he was shocked and appalled by the video. Rodriguez was placed on paid leave in the immediate aftermath. He was ultimately charged with assault and battery. A couple of weeks after the incident, he was fired from the police department. Number 13. Emily Hershowitz In August of 2022, Ossining Village Police Chief Kevin Sylvester filed a complaint with the Westchester District Attorney's Office in New York over threatening messages sent to one of his officers. 36-year-old Emily Hershowitz first revealed the alleged harassment she'd been suffering back in May of that year. She told the DA's office that she'd been receiving anonymous threats from multiple different phone numbers. The officer further claimed that some of her colleagues were likely behind the messages. As the issue drew more attention from the public and investigators, however, suspicions began to arise regarding the true source of the anonymous threats by October. Authorities had gathered enough evidence to obtain a search warrant for Hershowitz's phone and digital records. It was established that the woman controlled the phone numbers responsible for the menacing texts and that she'd actually sent the messages to herself. She was consequently charged with four counts of third degree falsely reporting an incident, as well as three counts of first degree filing a false instrument. During the investigation, police chief Sylvester had tried to blame the threats on officer Luis Rinaldi, who later sued the chief after being forced to resign. In the wake of Hershowitz's arrest, Sylvester suspended her with pay, which many viewed as lenient. When Rinaldi and co-plaintiff Andrea Zambrano filed litigation against Sylvester, they alleged that the chief was in an intimate relationship with Hershowitz and had therefore doled out a lighter punishment for her. They further claimed that Sylvester had tried to pin Hershowitz's crimes on them despite having no evidence to support his accusations. As of the latest developments, the multifaceted situation hadn't yet been resolved. Number 12. Alexander Shaoni a Seminole County Sheriff's deputy conducted a traffic stop along Florida Avenue, north of Oviedo, on June the 6th of 2023. The deputy had observed an Orlando Police Department cruiser traveling at upwards of 80 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour zone with no lights or sirens activated. He gave chase in the area of Florida Avenue and De Leon Street, but the runaway cruiser refused to pull over. Eventually, the deputy managed to pull in front of the OPD vehicle to make it stop. The individual behind the wheel of the cruiser got out to meet the deputy dressed in full police uniform. Later identified as Officer Alexander Shaoni, the man refused to show the deputy his driver's license, stating he was on his way to work. He subsequently got back in the cruiser and sped off. Shortly thereafter, the Orlando Police Department announced that Shaoni had been relieved of duty. Pending further investigation, he also faced criminal charges of reckless driving, fleeing, and eluding law enforcement and resisting an officer without violence. Body cam footage of the deputy's encounter with Shoney went viral in the incident's aftermath. In August of 2023, it was reported that Shoney had entered a pre-trial intervention agreement which required 12 months of supervision. The agreement included $500 worth of fines and fees, as well as a mandate that Shaoni complete 40 hours of community service and apologize to the deputy who pulled him over. If the officer completed each of the requirements, his criminal charges would be dropped. Number 11. Telvin Wilson An Arkansas cop was busted trying to solicit intercourse from a minor 
who was actually an undercover police officer during the summer of 2023. 31-year-old Telvin Wilson from Texarkana was one of three suspects caught through a sting operation conducted by law enforcement in the twin city of Texarkana, Texas. Investigators placed an advertisement on a website used by escorts then posed as a minor in subsequent conversations with potentially interested clients. Wilson and the other men agreed to meet up with the decoy at a house, however, when they knocked on the front door, they were met by police officers rather than the girl they were expecting. Wilson, who began his career in law enforcement in 2016, was charged with online solicitation of a minor. He was held in custody on a $100,000 bond. In an eerie twist, it was revealed that the man had once described himself as a figure that our young people can come and talk to in a spotlight Facebook post just a few months before his arrest. The two other suspects linked to the sting operation were 33-year-old Adarius Wills and James Willis, aged 37. As of the most recent updates, they were both in custody with several pending criminal charges. Number 10. Johnny Diaz On May the 23rd of 2018, New York cop Johnny Diaz arrested a drug dealer but failed to report $1,000 in cash that he recovered from the man. In the days and weeks that followed, 48-year-old Diaz kept in close contact with the dealer and the two established a professional rapport. The officer reported he offered to return the dealer's cell phone from an evidence locker and, in return, received a $250 bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Scotch. As their relationship developed, Diaz even offered to throw out the man's pending criminal case in exchange for $20,000. Then, on June the 15th, he helped the dealer transport over two pounds of cocaine in exchange for $4,000, telling his criminal associate, I should know better, I'm a cop. By the end of June, Diaz was arrested and was facing a slew of charges that included first-degree possession of a controlled substance. Diaz's undoing had been his relationship with the drug dealer, who, as it turned out, was an undercover investigator. Police officials had opened an internal probe into Diaz following allegations that he was offering criminals freedom in exchange for money. In August, the crooked cop pleaded guilty to second-degree criminal possession of a controlled substance, second-degree bribery, and petty larceny. He was sentenced to six years in prison for his crimes. Number 9. Alisa Bajrak Taravich On April the 29th of 2023, NYPD officers stopped a vehicle belonging to a local dealer who was described as a major player in the city's drug trade. Before they could investigate the suspect and potentially arrest him for trafficking, however, officers were met by the man's girlfriend, Alisa Bajrak Taravich, aged 33. The latter, a Yonkers resident who'd been a police officer for 11 years, launched a belligerent tirade in an attempt to prevent her colleagues from busting her boyfriend. Bajrak Taravich became so uncooperative, in fact, that the officers at the scene needed to call for backup in order to subdue her. In the end, the dealer was allowed to go free, while law enforcement filed a report about Bajrak Taravich's behavior. Following the events of the traffic stop, the woman had her service weapon confiscated and was reassigned to desk duty while detectives investigated her association with the dealer. According to subsequent reports, Bajrak Terovich had been warned to stay away from the man who was already under police surveillance at the start of their relationship. She'd previously tried to intervene when cops showed up at the dealer's Manhattan residence and was subsequently urged by colleagues to end their involvement. Number 8. Nasia Stroud 29-year-old Nasia Stroud, a six-year veteran of the NYPD, assigned to the Fleet Services Division, was arrested for serving as a drug courier in the spring of 2017. Between the months of April and June, Stroud was paid $2,000 to transport illegal substances to another courier. She used codes to cover up her activities, devising the phrase, shopping at Woodbury, for any communications involving future drug drop-offs. Stroud allegedly told the courier that she was a police officer, stating that she would flash her badge to avoid further investigation if they were ever stopped by law enforcement. Her plan to avoid getting arrested evidently didn't work as she was in handcuffs by mid-June. Internal investigators had already been looking into Stroud by the time she'd started delivering drugs 
She'd been placed on modified duty, which meant she'd been stripped of her service weapon and limited to desk work. The courier with whom she'd been doing business was actually an undercover detective. The woman consequently faced charges of criminal possession and official misconduct. In May of the following year, a judge found Stroud guilty on all charges. She tearfully begged for the verdict to be thrown out while appearing in Manhattan Supreme Court in June. She indicated that a felony conviction would prevent her from joining the army, which she'd always dreamed of doing nevertheless. The presiding judge showed no leniency, sentencing Stroud to eight years behind bars for her crimes. Number 7. Nidia Garcia Nidia Garcia, who worked for police in the Mexican city of Escobedo, was fired after a photo of her posing topless in her patrol vehicle made the rounds on social media in April of 2016. The racy picture showed Garcia flashing her bare chest while wearing her police uniform and holding a rifle. On Facebook, the woman admitted to taking the picture while on duty but denied uploading it to social media. Police officials opened an investigation into the matter but Garcia resigned before a resolution could be reached. Some have speculated that the woman quit her job in order to pursue one of the many modeling opportunities presented to her in the wake of the nude picture scandal. Subsequent reports mentioned that several men's magazines and local businessmen had expressed interest in capitalizing on Garcia's sudden popularity. The controversy caused irrevocable damage to the former cop's family as it reportedly prompted her husband to leave her. After ending her law enforcement career, the mother of two was said to have started working as a table dancer in gentlemen's clubs across Mexico. Number 6. Karina Salgado Early on the morning of November the 1st of 2019, Chicago police dispatched officers to the 3700 block of North Broadway. A tipster had contacted them about a woman who'd been denied entry to a Boys Town nightclub. The establishment, which featured a dance club and drag shows, had repeatedly turned the woman in question away, but she kept trying to sneak in regardless. Officers tracked down the individual who was reportedly wearing red and white face paint, apparently as part of a Pennywise Halloween costume. They informed her that she wasn't allowed to go into the nightclub, but nevertheless, she attempted to get into the building yet again, so they physically blocked her path. Shortly after, the woman, who was intoxicated, slapped an officer in the face with an open hand. She was consequently arrested and charged with misdemeanor counts of criminal damage to property, battery, and resisting or obstructing a peace officer. Subsequent reports on the matter identified the suspect as 30-year-old Karina Salgado, an off-duty police officer. Following her arrest, Salgado was moved to a non-emergency role within the department pending further investigation. Number 5. Melissa Adamson a Pennsylvania cop lost her job after a Snapchat selfie with text that included a racial slur started circulating online on September the 27th of 2016. The offensive post, uploaded by McKee Sport Police Officer Melissa Adamson, triggered a social media firestorm following its re-emergence. It was determined that Adamson had originally taken the picture several months prior when she'd worked for a different police department in Pitkin. While speaking with a local media outlet, Adamson said the post was a stupid mistake. She claimed that it was making the rounds months after she uploaded it because she had an altercation with a former colleague who was bringing up dirt from her past and trying to ruin her career. The controversy surrounding the selfie, which prompted an official statement from the mayor of McKee Sport, caused Adamson to lose her job with the local police department. She was also terminated from her part-time position with Versailles Police. Number 4. Lester Brown On the evening of December the 1st of 2018, Jose Garcia was arrested by Miami area police after a complaint was made about a drunk man breaking a house window. The suspect was taken to Miami-Dade County Jail for processing on charges of disorderly intoxication and resisting arrest. As Garcia was being escorted into the booking room, 
A Homestead police officer abruptly shoved him face first into a concrete wall. The suspect immediately started bleeding from a cut on his forehead, which was treated with surgical glue at the hospital. In the resulting case report, Officer Lester Brown claimed that Garcia had been physically resisting him and was trying to attack other officers at the jail. Brown further stated that at one point, Garcia fell forward and cracked his head on the wall accidentally. None of the officer's colleagues could substantiate his claims. The other officers at the scene reportedly observed Brown pushed the suspect unprovoked. Witness testimony was corroborated by video footage taken from the jail security cameras. As a result, Brown was arrested and charged with felony battery and official misconduct. Homestead Police Chief Alexander Raleigh Jr. stated in a press conference that Brown had been suspended without pay pending his likely termination. Number 3. The Dirty 30 During the early 1990s, corruption was rampant among New York City police officers, especially those stationed in the Harlem neighborhood of Upper Manhattan. The issue became so pervasive that the city's mayor appointed a judge to create the Mullen Commission. The mandate was aimed at investigating and removing corrupt forces within the NYPD. In 1992, Sergeant Kevin Nannery began overseeing a collection of about 30 corrupt officers. The group, most of whom were stationed at the 30th Precinct in Harlem, would regularly take part in booming. The illegal process entailed making fake radio calls to cover up unauthorized search and seizures at known drug dealers' apartments. The Dirty 30, as they would come to be known as, would steal drugs and money from criminals' homes, then sell the illegal substances at half price right from the 30th precinct. The group was also accused of extorting criminals, forcing illegal drug wholesalers to give them a weekly payoff in exchange for freedom. The Dirty 30 eventually collapsed after a former member went undercover for an internal investigation. A total of 33 officers, including Nannery, were arrested in connection with the scandal. They faced charges that included civil rights conspiracy, perjury, extortion and grand larceny, as well as the possession and distribution of narcotics. Today's topic was requested by HJ Lozano 79 and Gian 19791. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Betty Jo Shelby on the evening of September the 16th of 2016, police in Tulsa, Oklahoma received a call about an abandoned vehicle blocking traffic in the middle of 36th Street North. Responding officers encountered a man later identified as 40-year-old Terence Crutcher standing in the street near the apparently stalled vehicle. One of the officers, Betty Jo Shelby, would later state that she believed Crutcher was under the influence of PCP, which turned out to be an accurate assessment. A police helicopter arrived at the scene and the officers inside were recorded saying, this guy's still walking and isn't following commands. It's time for a taser, I think. That looks like a bad dude too. Could be on something. Shortly thereafter, as Crutcher was walking back to his vehicle with his hands up, Officer Tyler Turnber deployed his taser while Shelby fired her service weapon. It took multiple minutes for someone to administer Crutcher aid after the bullet Shelby fired struck him in the chest. He succumbed to his injuries in the hospital later that day. The officers involved were placed on paid leave in the immediate aftermath. Eventually, authorities launched a criminal investigation into the shooting. A week later, the Tulsa County District Attorney filed first-degree manslaughter charges against Shelby. She turned herself into the county jail and was held for 20 minutes before posting bail. A vocal contingent of the general public denounced Shelby's actions on the day of Crutcher's death. The incident sparked protests outside the county courthouse and a civil rights probe by the U.S. Department of Justice during the trial. The jury questioned Shelby's judgment as a law enforcement officer. They also expressed their belief that serious consideration should be given to whether she be allowed to return to the force. In the end, however, the jury found Shelby not guilty of first-degree manslaughter. She quit the Tulsa Police Department, subsequently becoming a Rogers County Sheriff's Deputy. We have our release on 11 times the police failed to act. Lined up for you after number one. 
in case you're still longing for more they will kill you content today. Number 1. Galib Chowdhury In June of 2023, Houston authorities responded to the 10300 block of Clay Road near Shadowdale, where a woman had reportedly been shot in the face. The victim, 30-year-old Sadeth Iqbal, was taken to the hospital for emergency surgery but ultimately survived. Investigators determined that Iqbal had been shot by her husband, Galib Chowdhury, a Houston police officer who was off duty at the time. The man was arrested and charged with aggravated assault of a family member with serious bodily injury. In a subsequent press conference, HPD Chief Troy Finner mentioned that the department was viewing the matter as a case of domestic violence that started as an argument. During initial talks with Iqbal, she told investigators that the shooting had been an accident. However, after Chowdhury's charges were filed, the woman changed her tune. She said she'd initially protected her husband because she was afraid that his position as a policeman might prevent him from getting criminally charged. Local media outlets gained access to angry messages that Chowdhury sent to Iqbal shortly before the shooting. Investigators also recovered syringes and doses of clenbuterol, a stimulant typically abused by bodybuilders and athletes. The DEA reportedly linked the drug to significant adverse effects including agitation and anxiety. A sweep of the couple's northwest Houston apartment also unearthed passports, weapons, ammunition and various other items. Chowdhury was held in custody on a $125,000 bond. With his criminal case pending, the man was terminated by the Houston Police Department. Number 11. Shay Sturt Australian couple Caitlin O'Brien and Shay Sturt had a contentious relationship spanning over a decade. The first domestic incident reported to the police was in 2008, when an argument about moving furniture in O'Brien's Melbourne apartment turned violent. The young woman told local law enforcement that Sturt had struck her, but she later withdrew the complaint. O'Brien, who worked as a nurse, reportedly fled from her home following another violent altercation two years later. Sturt had become agitated after O'Brien suggested he might need psychological help. He went on to pull her by the hair and punch her several times before she escaped. The man consequently faced assault charges but was placed on an adjourned good behavior bond. In the years that followed, O'Brien made over 30 visits to her general practitioner due to injuries she sustained from her partner's physical attacks. Following each domestic episode, she would report Sturt to the police only to be manipulated into dropping the case. Sturt was eventually diagnosed with schizophrenia-type personality disorder, which was being worsened by his excessive cannabis use. On several occasions, his mental health problems landed him in the hospital as he struggled to keep his paranoid delusions at bay. Despite Sturt's violent tendencies, O'Brien never received the help she was so desperate for, and the situation took a drastic turn in the summer of 2019. In May, O'Brien underwent a procedure to remove a tumor from her brain. She was forced to stay home throughout the recovery process, which started to put an untenable strain on her relationship with Sturt, whose condition was only worsening. He told O'Brien he thought the neighbors were worshiping Satan and that she herself was a devil. The man even made claims that he was Jesus and instructed O'Brien to eat an apple so she could be enlightened like Adam and Eve. On June the 23rd, the woman decided she'd had enough. She called the police on Sturt, who was behaving very erratically. He was taken to the Alfred Hospital, where he was detained under the Mental Health Act as doctors made their assessment. O'Brien was fearful that Sturt might murder her in the midst of a psychotic episode, a concern she expressed to him while he was in the hospital. As she was making arrangements to hide out at an ex-boyfriend's place, the hospital abruptly released Sturt who'd somehow convinced the doctors that he was of stable mind. On June the 25th, only two days after he was admitted to the mental health ward, Sturt went to O'Brien's flat and unleashed a brutal attack, stabbing her with scissors, smothering her with a pillow, and tying pants tightly around her neck to ensure she was dead. While in jail awaiting the resulting murder trial, Sturt penned handwritten letters detailing the extent of his descent into madness. In the notes, he indicated that O'Brien would likely still be alive if the authorities hadn't chosen to release him after only a few hours of observation. He ultimately agreed to a plea deal and was given a 22-year prison term of which he'd need to serve 16 years before being eligible for parole. Number 10. Alex Staines 
In January of 2021, English police constables Gemma Walsh Beasley and Mike McDermott were dispatched to investigate a domestic violence report at a home in Welling Garden City, Hertfordshire. 25-year-old Christy Fruin told the officers that her ex-boyfriend, Alex Staines, had harassed, stalked, and assaulted her on several occasions during their years-long relationship and had even left their children alone in the house to track her whereabouts. At the time, 30-year-old Staines was out on bond in connection with a previous incident that led to Fruin being labelled a high-risk domestic abuse victim in law enforcement databases. Nevertheless, Constables Walsh Beasley and McDermott declined to arrest Staines for his latest abuse and even allowed the couple's two youngest children to stay with him overnight. The next morning when he went to drop the kids off at Fruin's place, he forced his way inside and grabbed a large kitchen knife. A merciless, frenzied attack ensued over the next six minutes. The Staines repeatedly plunged the knife into Fruin's face, neck, throat, and arm, where she had a tattoo of the man's name. Despite Fruin's cries for help to the police and Staines' past death threats against the woman, there were no barriers put in place to thwart the fatal attack. In June of 2021, Staines was jailed for life, with his minimum term set at 22 years. Constables Walsh, Beasley and McDermott were investigated by the independent office for police conduct. It was determined that the officers had failed to adequately investigate the allegations against Staines and hadn't complied with standard procedures in regards to domestic abuse. As punishment, Walsh, Beasley and McDermott were both issued formal written warnings. Number 9. Trevor Heitman. On August the 23rd of 2018, the police in San Diego, California, received a call from a psychiatrist concerned for the mental well-being of a family friend. I'm calling to report an emergency. I believe there's an individual who is a danger to himself and to others. The caller told law enforcement who subsequently dispatched three officers to the home of 18-year-old Trevor Heitman, the young man who'd amassed nearly 900,000 YouTube subscribers under the alias McSkillet was asleep upstairs when the police arrived. They spoke with his parents who asked him to help get their son to a doctor. The teen's mother informed the officers that he'd sent her a threatening text message and ordered her to leave the house. She went on to describe Heitman's manic behavior while imploring the police to have him checked out by mental health professionals. One of the officers downplayed how involved they'd be allowed to be, given that Heitman had never been officially diagnosed with a mental disorder. The policeman added, he has to be gravely disabled. He has to have a credible threat against somebody. A short time later, the family friend who dialed 911 arrived and pleaded with the officers to help Heitman, indicating the team was likely to do something violent if left to his own devices. Eventually, the officers left without taking any action. Hours later, Heitman awoke and left the house, getting behind the wheel of his McLaren, which he'd purchased with a portion of his considerable YouTube earnings. He bumped into his father's vehicle on his way out of the driveway before busting through a fence and speeding off. Heitman took his McLaren onto I-805 but started driving southbound in the northbound lanes. He eventually slammed into an oncoming SUV at a speed of over 100 miles per hour. The collision killed the other motorist, her daughter, and Heitman himself. The California Highway Patrol stated that the crash caused a chain reaction that came to involve at least five other vehicles. While Heitman was a popular gaming YouTuber, with a sizable online following and millions of dollars to his name, his state of mind had been rapidly declining leading up to the incident. He had only a few friends in real life, the majority of whom were in the process of moving away to college, leaving him at home alone in the late summer of 2020. Heitman's family announced that they'd be pursuing litigation against the city of San Diego, accusing law enforcement of not doing enough to prevent the deadly events of August the 23rd of 2018. News of the suit was accompanied by the release of body cam footage from San Diego Police's initial response to Heitman's house. Many were critical of the responding officer's seemingly uncaring and nonchalant attitude towards what they were being told was a serious situation. Number 8. Dylan Dowman On August the 15th of 2022, Toronto Police Constable Anson Alfonso and his partner, Constable Sang Yub Lee, were called to the scene of a reported domestic incident. They spoke with 23-year-old Daniela Malia, who claimed that her ex-boyfriend had been harassing her and sending threatening text messages. The interaction, which was recorded by police-worn body cameras, lasted about 39 minutes. 
during which time the officers were said to have gathered sufficient evidence that provided reasonable grounds to believe a criminal offense had occurred. However, Constable Alfonso reportedly spoke with the ex-boyfriend, Dylan Dowman, for only three minutes before leaving and failing to take any further action to protect Malia. Three days later, the young woman was found dead in an underground garage near Jane Street and Shepherd Avenue. Dalman had fatally shot her. He was ultimately arrested on a charge of first-degree murder, but the police constables who'd ignored Malia's cries for help also faced legal repercussions as a result of the incident. According to police tribunal records, Constable Alfonso failed to adequately investigate the domestic report, improperly considering it a he-said-she-said said situation. He was also accused of providing an inaccurate account of the call to his supervisor, indicating there wasn't an imminent threat against Malia despite ample evidence that there was. When the supervisor asked Alfonso whether there was information linking either Malia or Dalman to firearms, the constable said no. However, at the time of the visit to Malia's residence, Dalman reportedly had an active firearm prohibition from past offenses. Both Alfonso and Constable Lee faced police act charges, including deceit, neglect of duty and making false or misleading statements. Toronto police officials revealed that Alfonso, a four-year veteran of the force, was suspended with pay while the case made its way through the courts. As per the terms of the Police Services Act, the city's police chief met with the victim's family to inform them of his officers' alleged misconduct and to notify them of charges laid by the force's professional standards unit. The president of the Toronto Police Association called the incident tragic for everyone involved and reiterated that although it's difficult, we must wait for the disciplinary process to take its course. Number 7. Joseph Cass 38-year-old Scott Dunster from the UK had his car broken into outside his home in Eastbourne in Sussex on New Year's Eve 2022. The burglar reportedly stole his wife's purse and also snagged the couple's joint bank card before fleeing the scene. Dunster subsequently noticed that a charge for roughly $75 had been made at an off-license store using his and his wife's card. The father of three reported both the theft and the unauthorized charge to Sussex Police, which processed the report at about 7.45 a.m. on December the 31st. In a statement later made by a department spokesperson, it was revealed that the report was then allocated to a local officer for further investigation, but Dunster claimed that he received no indication that he'd be receiving help from law enforcement. The man ultimately decided to take matters into his own hands rather than rely on the police. He went down to the shop where the burglar had used the card and was able to obtain CCTV footage of the unauthorized transaction as well as the thief himself. Dunster took screenshots of the footage and posted them to Facebook, enlisting the help of the general public in identifying the criminal. Local social media users positively identified him as 27-year-old Joseph Cass. On the afternoon of January the 2nd of 2023, Dunster's friend spotted Cass in the Eastbourne Town Centre. Simultaneously, Sussex officers were dealing with an unrelated incident nearby, and Dunstan was unable to reach anyone using 101, the police's non-emergency line. Seeking to bring a swift resolution, Dunster chased after Cass himself. He reportedly pursued the suspect through the town centre for about 600 yards before tackling him and pinning him to the ground with the help of security stewards. The nearby officers subsequently arrived to take Cass into custody. He was charged with fraud by false representation, to which he pleaded guilty at Brighton Magistrates Court the following day. Cass was later jailed for 35 weeks as punishment. A member of Sussex Police's Criminal Investigations Department said in a statement, We commend the victim for being so proactive and providing us with additional information, which led to Cass's being apprehended. Dunster, however, was highly critical of the authorities' handling of his ordeal, indicating he was angry that he needed to risk his own life to catch the thief. Number 6. Stefan Seltve In July of 2013, reports surfaced online about a pending lawsuit against the city of Eugene, Oregon. The chief of police and a police department supervisor, who were accused of failing to halt harassment and abuse by one of their own officers. 44-year-old Stefan Seltve, a 17-year-old veteran of the Eugene Police Force, had his duties scaled back in October of 2012 as the controversy surrounding his alleged mistreatment of six different women, including co-workers and a fellow officer's wife, started to heat up. In December of that year, Seltve was placed on administrative leave, pending an internal investigation into his misconduct. Back in July, a female Eugene officer had gone to her superiors to report that Seltve had been inappropriately pestering her since she was a new recruit 
over a decade earlier. Several other female department employees made similar complaints against the veteran officer. His creepy behavior and repeated unwanted advances had been largely overlooked over the years. In subsequent reports, it was revealed that some within the department refrained from dealing with the situation out of loyalty to Selt Vey's wife, who also worked for the police. The lead internal investigator called the man's actions despicable, while urging other victims of his abuse to step forward and voice their stories. On July the 24th of 2013, Seltve, who'd resigned from the force by that point, pleaded guilty to misdemeanor harassment and abuse charges, and was consequently sentenced to 140 days in jail. He was also ordered to register as an offender. As his punishment was being handed down, Seltve issued an apology to the co-workers he'd victimized, stating he'd brought shame to the department and the community. The resulting lawsuit against the city and police officials was filed by two of Seltve's victims, identified only as Jane Doe and Jean Co. The plaintiffs alleged that Seltve's touching and harassing of women was well known in police circles, but that supervisors had ignored the pervasive knowledge that he was a dangerous predator. The most readily available updates on the case failed to mention if any resolution had ever been reached. Number 5. The Killing of Banaz Mahmood When she was only a teenager, Banaz Mahmood from Mitcham, South London, was forced into an arranged marriage with a man from her family's hometown of Kaladzia in Iraqi Kurdistan. Her husband, who was 10 years her senior, was described as illiterate and old-fashioned. The police were called to their residence on numerous occasions throughout their marriage for reports of Banaz being beaten and taken advantage of. While the young woman's relatives were aware of the violence, they told her that abandoning the marriage would bring dishonor to the family. In spite of her family's wishes, Banaz eventually ended their relationship, returning to the family home in July of 2005. Around that time, she started dating a man of her own choosing, whom the rest of her family disapproved of, particularly her father and uncle. In a meeting held at the latter's home in December of 2005, the family decided to kill both Banaz and her new boyfriend for the shame they supposedly brought upon the community. On December the 2nd, Banaz went to the police after overhearing a conversation about the murder plot between her uncle and mother 10 days later. After law enforcement hadn't taken any action in connection with her report, she delivered a letter to the Wimbledon police station in which she provided the names of each of the relatives who wanted her dead. Then on New Year's Eve, the police were called to a cafe in Wimbledon where Banaz said her father had made an attempt on her life. Officers noted that she was intoxicated, but she claimed it was her father who'd forced her to drink. She had cuts on her hands, having smashed the window during her escape, and was clearly in a distressed state. However, the police constable who responded to the scene didn't believe Banaz's claims against her father, describing her as manipulative and melodramatic. The officer even wanted to criminally charge Banaz for breaking the glass window. With nowhere else to turn, the young woman was forced to face her family's wrath without the aid of law enforcement. On January the 24th of 2006, Banaz was sleeping at the family home alone. Later that morning, two of her cousins, along with a man by the name of Mohammed Marid Hama, arrived and subjected her to more than two hours of abuse and torture before fatally strangling her with a ligature. The following day, her boyfriend reported her missing to the police, who didn't take the report seriously at first. Banaz's family insisted that she wasn't missing and that she was known to stay out overnight. The boyfriend ended up harassing the authorities into taking action, and the case was handed over to the Metropolitan Police Homicide and Serious Crime Command. Despite attempts by members of the wider Kurdish community to stymie the investigation, the police were able to arrest Mohammed Marid Hama in early February. While in custody, the suspect was covertly recorded as he bragged about the murder, implicating the victim's uncle, cousins, and father in the process. The recorded conversations, along with phone and vehicle tracking data, allowed law enforcement to locate Banaz's remains in late April. A few days later, her uncle was arrested for murder. Her father faced the same charge three months later. In all, seven individuals were criminally charged in connection with Banaz's honor killing. Mohammed married Hama, as well as the victim's father and uncle, were each jailed for life. The two cousins present at the murder scene were likewise given life sentences, while a third cousin faced eight years imprisonment. In the aftermath, the Independent Police Complaints Commission investigated law enforcement's handling of the situation leading up to Banaz's murder. Although the commission found that the victim had been let down by the police, the constable who responded to the scene at the Wimbledon Cafe was only given the lowest disciplinary sanction and was subsequently promoted. Number 4. Rob Elementary School Shooting 
Shortly after 11 a.m. on May the 24th of 2022, Texas teen Salvador Ramos shot his grandmother in the face following an argument over a phone bill at their Ovalde residence. The 18-year-old then got into his grandmother's pickup truck with a tactical vest and AR-15-style rifle in tow and made his way towards Robb Elementary School. Ramos sent a private Facebook message to a German teen he'd met online indicating his plans to commit a mass killing at his old elementary school. He crashed the truck through a barricade outside the school before hopping the fence to gain access to the grounds. Several 911 calls were placed about the crashed vehicle, prompting a school resource officer to drive to the campus. Upon his arrival, he pursued a teacher, whom he erroneously believed to be the perpetrator driving right past Ramos in the process. As the latter was approaching the school building, an officer reportedly had his rifle aimed directly at him. However, the officer failed to subdue the impending school shooter because he didn't have authorization to fire from his supervisor. Ramos entered the building and walked down the hallway before entering classroom 111, which was internally connected to classroom 112. Testimony from surviving witnesses revealed that the young man announced, you're all gonna die, before opening fire. The majority of the bloodshed took place within the next few minutes, but Ramos remained barricaded inside the classroom for over an hour while standing off with police. Uvalde law enforcement's response to the scene has been criticized for its lack of urgency and effectiveness. The Texas Department of Public Safety stated that prior to the arrival of tactical units, there were at least 19 police officers inside the school who made no effort to gain entry to the room where Ramos was holed up. According to further department findings, the decision to wait for the arrival of tactical units was made under the false belief that Ramos had been sequestered to a classroom where he could do no more harm. Arnulfo Reyes, a teacher in classroom 111, recounted how he heard law enforcement approach his classroom from what sounded like the hallway three times, but they didn't enter. On one such occasion, Reyes heard a student in the adjoining room shout, Officer, we're in here! We're in here! At which point, Ramos unloaded another barrage of bullets. Authorities were unable to establish negotiations with the suspect, and on body cam footage, there was even a point where he was audibly and profanely taunting them as they waited to obtain a master key from the janitor to unlock the classroom door Officers were joined by U.S. Border Patrol tactical agents with a ballistic shield. There was evidence that the classroom door was unlocked the whole time, however, and law enforcement subsequently rushed inside. They were met with fire from Ramos, who was hiding in a closet, but they killed him with returned fire. A report conducted by the Texas House of Representatives Investigative Committee found systemic failures and egregious poor decision-making by responding law enforcement. The report cited an unacceptably long period of time before officers breached the classroom and began rescue efforts. There were 22 fatalities as a result of the incident, including Ramos himself. Another 18 were injured, including Ramos's grandmother, who survived after being airlifted to a hospital in San Antonio. In the aftermath of the shooting, Rob Elementary was permanently closed and slated to be demolished. Number 3. Cleotha Henderson during the early hours of July the 5th of 2021, a car pulled up to the loading dock on the grounds of FedEx Freight's operations facility at 461 Winchester Road in Memphis, Tennessee. A male suspect subsequently stole seven television sets before fleeing the scene. At the time of the theft, the facility was closed for Independence Day, leaving only the security guard on the property. The man on duty that night was Cleotha Henderson, who'd managed to find and hold down a job in security despite his criminal record, which included a stint in prison less than a year earlier. Twelve days later, FedEx Freight suffered a second break-in, during which two male suspects entered the property through a dock door, before pilfering several boxes of Nike apparel worth a total of $2,500. An affidavit of complaint the following month listed Henderson as the suspect in both thefts, and a warrant was thus issued for his arrest. Given his record, the man could have faced an additional two to four years in prison if convicted of the burglaries. A couple of months later, Henderson began talking to a woman on a dating app. The pair met in person for the first time on September the 21st, about a week after they had initially begun conversing. The woman, identified as 22-year-old Alicia Franklin, later told investigators that upon meeting up with Henderson, he pulled out a gun, blindfolded her, and took her to a vacant lot behind the lakes at Ridgeway apartment complex where he abused her. Franklin immediately reported the crime to Memphis police. 
The young woman didn't receive the urgent response from law enforcement that she was hoping for, and the case subsequently languished without any further developments for the better part of a year. In June of 2022, Henderson was taken into custody in connection with the FedEx burglaries, but the charges were dropped because of a lack of evidence and the man was released. On September 2nd of 2022, Henderson stalked a woman who was out for an early morning jog on the University of Memphis campus. He eventually forced her into his car at gunpoint and killed her. The victim was identified as teacher, mother of two, and business heiress Eliza Fletcher. Three days later, her body was found behind an abandoned house following a massive search effort by local authorities. Memphis police identified Henderson as a suspect and took him back into custody on murder charges. Following his latest arrest, investigators finally linked him to Franklin's assault almost a year after the fact. He consequently faced charges in connection with that incident as well. Franklin subsequently filed a lawsuit against the city of Memphis, alleging that the police's failure to properly investigate her attack had enabled Henderson to victimize Fletcher, this time to the extent of murder. In a 25-page court filing, city officials admitted that law enforcement had been aware of Franklin's report all the way back in September of 2021. However, they refuted that the young woman had been able to positively identify her attacker to officers. Franklin questioned why DNA evidence of her assault was left to sit on a shelf in a crime lab for nearly a year before being examined. She also claimed to have suffered emotional damages as a result of the ordeal. In February of 2023, Henderson pleaded not guilty to his various crimes. He was subsequently due back in court in late March. Around that time, Judge Mary Wagner of the Shelby County Circuit Court submitted an order dismissing Franklin's lawsuit. Number 2. Queensland First Nations Women In the summer of 2022, a whistleblower from the Queensland Police Service publicly claimed that department officials had instructed her to withhold evidence of police failures in multiple domestic violence cases. The officer, who wished to remain anonymous, had been on the force for more than 20 years, working as a police liaison to the Domestic and Family Violence Death Review Unit of the State Coroner's Office. According to her allegations, there had been at least four separate domestic violence cases involving First Nations women over a six-month period, all of which were not properly investigated by senior officers. In each case, the indigenous victims were eventually killed by their partners, but their deaths were officially investigated as drug overdoses. The whistleblower said she was criticized by colleagues within the police department who complained when she sent the cases to the coroner's office for further review. She also claimed that reports about police involvement in family violence-related deaths were regularly redacted, removing information regarding inadequate police actions and or inaction. In 2021, the officer made a formal complaint to the Crime and Corruption Commission about the request to withhold evidence. The commission then moved to investigate her claims but placed the internal review in the hands of a police officer whose direct supervisor was one of the two senior officers named in the complaint. The whistleblower asked for the case to be relocated to someone who could be trusted to review the data impartially. Her request was denied and the investigation ultimately found no evidence of police wrongdoing. Number 1. John Wharton on the morning of February the 8th of 2013, police in the village of Frankley, in Birmingham, England, received a call from a nine-year-old girl who said she was unable to wake either of her parents. The child noted that her mother's face had been swollen the night before and also indicated that her father had been looking after her mother. Authorities immediately noticed that there was a high-risk domestic violence marker on the residence. Officers arrived at the scene within minutes, whereupon they determined that both 34-year-old Suzanne Van Hagen and her partner, John Wharton, were deceased. The child who made the call had found Van Hagen, her mother, lying dead beside a mattress in the bedroom, while Wharton, her father, was in the living room. First responders brought the child to nearby Birmingham Children's Hospital, where it was determined that she was unharmed. During the resulting police investigation, it emerged that 37-year-old Wharton had been abusive throughout his and Van Hagen's relationship. The first signs of physical abuse came in 2011, when the woman's hairdresser noticed she had a black eye. Van Hagen claimed to have sustained the injury in a quad bike accident, but the hairdresser, as well as Van Hagen's loved ones, knew that wasn't true. The woman's sisters subsequently confronted Wharton, who became furious and aggressive. His demeanor grew so hostile that the sisters eventually needed to leave the house for fear of being physically attacked themselves. Over the course of the next 18 months, 
Van Hagen became increasingly isolated from her family before ceasing all contact with them altogether. The Van Hagens tried repeatedly to notify police and social services of the threat Wharton posed to Suzanne and the couple's daughter. They were largely ignored, however, despite Wharton's past criminal convictions, which had led to him spending some time in a mental hospital. While investigating the crime scene on February the 8th, authorities noted that there were strangulation marks on Van Hagen's neck, leading to the assumption that Wharton had murdered her. Officers informed the victim's relatives of their belief that she'd been killed by her partner. However, a post-mortem examination revealed the presence of drugs in the systems of both deceased, so investigators pivoted. They started running with the working theory that the couple had accidentally overdosed during an intimate game. A press release was even issued to that effect in March of 2013, which thoroughly angered Van Hagen's family. They knew that she'd been murdered, but the police were seemingly unwilling to make that determination in spite of the abundance of evidence. In 2017, West Midlands Police finally commenced a review of the officer's actions before and after Van Hagen's death. The report described a series of failures by those involved in the investigation, concluding that Van Hagen and her child should have been removed from the abusive household long before the situation escalated out of control. It also stated that law enforcement's decision to shut down the homicide investigation following the discovery of drugs in the couple's systems had been misguided. West Midlands police neglected to make a public comment on the report for four whole years. On September the 10th of 2021, the department uploaded a YouTube video of their chief constable, David Thompson, reading an apology to the Van Hagen family. Despite the omission of failure, the department still refrained from calling Van Hagen's death a homicide and didn't even send a link to their YouTube apology to the family, who had to look it up themselves. In 2022, it was reported that the couple's daughter, now 18 years old, was slated to study nursing at university. Thanks for watching. If you witnessed the police car speeding without its lights or siren activated, what would you do and why? Let us know in the comments section below.